Thanks for checking out a sermon from First United Methodist Church located in Sheridan, Wyoming. To learn more about who we are, please check out our webpage at fumcsheridanwy.org. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 25 to the second verse in chapter 5. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So then, putting away falsehood, let us all speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing, rather let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is a need so that your words may give grace to those who hear, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? God, I ask that the meditation of all of our hearts and the words of my mouth be pleasing and glorifying to you. Amen. All right, so we have, we have finished the messages to the churches, so that's no longer where we're at. Um, but it is sort of ironic that when, that when I went to the um, Revised Common Lectionary this week, I saw that the epistle reading, uh, which is what we heard read this morning from Ephesians, uh, was one of the ones that I could pick from. And I thought, hey, how cool is that? Because we talked about the message to the church in Ephesus towards the beginning of this sermon series. So I thought, yeah, I'll jump on that. And then when I read it, I I picked it before I even read it. And then when I read it, I thought, oh, this is a lot more complicated than what I had anticipated. Uh, Because we're talking about relationships. And that's hard. Relationships are hard. Uh, But we are. We're looking only instead of the, the letter that uh, or the, the recording uh, the message that John got in his vision to the church in Ephesus. We're reading a letter that more than likely Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. Now, I will say there is a debate as to whether or not Paul actually wrote this letter or not. Uh, we're going to leave that to the Bible scholars to debate Uh, But for the simplicity of the message this morning, I'm going to say that Paul wrote the letter. This uh, letter to the church, to the the church in Ephesus, is what we call a letter essay. Uh, It is a way in which to write to persuade a group of people uh, to behave in a certain way. Uh, It is encouraging the church to behave in a certain way, or challenging their way of thinking. What Paul is trying to do here is present a different view than what they're accustomed to, uh, to give those that are hearing this letter a different experience. Let me, let me start off by asking a question. How do you learn? Okay, example. We learn by example. Practice, trial and error, yeah, research, a teacher, uh, 
I don't know about you, but uh, in, in the way in which I have learned over the years, uh, I have learned so much by sitting and visiting with people of different life experience, of, of different understanding, of different beliefs, of different ideas. I've learned by trying something new, trial and error, we heard that. Uh, by and, and and the way in which we actually learn from those experiences, right, is keeping ourselves open. Anybody know everything? I totally do. So, <laughs> I, I one of one of the things that I will say quite frequently is: the more I think I know, the more I realize I need to know. Right? There's always something new to learn. But what keeps us from learning? Stop being stubborn? Pride? Time? Laziness? Fear? Oh, so good. All of those are so good. I hope someone wrote all of those down. What keeps us from learning? Uh, one of the, maybe us being stuck in our own minds, right? I'm right, you're wrong. I mean, let's, let's just be honest that uh, out of all seven generations that are alive right now, millennials are the best generation. That's, and if you disagree with me, you're wrong. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, pride can get in the way, right? Pride can get in the way. Uh, I think another thing that, that keeps us from learning uh, is romanticizing the past. And so then we get stuck. One of, one of the phrases that always sends shivers down my spine is, well, we've always done it this way. And so we, we, we choose not to try something new. And that's part of experimenting, right? Is trying something new and failing and learning from it. And I don't know about you, but the most times I learn in life is when I fail. And so this letter that is being written to the church from Paul in, uh, to, the, to the church in Ephesus is to help give them a different perspective, so that they can learn to grow into a, a community and, and to live into being, uh, being a church, being a congregation. This is, this is what is being built here. Our relationships with inside the community. A community of people that are building their lives together around the teachings and the leadership of Jesus the Christ. Now, Paul, as he was writing this letter, is writing it from prison. Uh, he was more than likely in Rome, uh, imprisoned in Rome. Paul was imprisoned uh, because he was arrested because he was charged with the offense of bringing a Gentile into the temple. Can you imagine being arrested? for bringing the wrong person to worship with you? Did anyone bring a friend to worship this morning? We might have to arrest you. Uh, and I don't mean to make light of that, but that's, that's the idea, right? Like that, this is why Paul was imprisoned. Uh, and so we can understand then the mindset of 2,000 years ago. And so Paul isn't just trying to help the church in Ephesus understand something, but he is also living what he is trying to teach, which is a very powerful way to be a teacher, right? So it helps us understand where he's coming from when he writes these words to the church in Ephesus. 
I think it's also important that we uh, put these verses into, into some uh, type of context. And I would encourage you to read, uh, read, the, read chapter 4 uh, from, the, from the beginning and, and through the verses that we read this morning. Because Paul is, all, is trying to get the church to understand the idea of taking off the old self and putting on the new. Uh, we might have heard that before. He talks about uh, putting, allowing ourselves to be clothed in the likeness of God. Uh, which brings Paul then into the place that is before us now, which is practical advice for discipleship. Now, who likes or appreciates practical advice? Yeah, no, no one does. Well, this is going to be a long sermon for you then. Paul is writing uh, to the church uh, in, in Ephesus here and how explaining how the congregation is to interact with each other. He's trying to help them understand how to build a strong community using Christ as the example. Because this is what we're called to be. We're called to be a community. We're called to be connected to one another. What is a community made up then? What is it made up of? Individuals? Connections. Individuals that are connected. Individuals with relationship to one another. Now remember, I said at the beginning, relationships take work, do they not? Let's say we have about 60 people here this morning, give or take. I'm terrible at estimating numbers, which is why the ushers uh, do the count and not me. But if we have 60 people here this morning, how many relationships does that represent? Anyone do quick math? Yeah, what's 60 times 60? 3,600, there we go. I knew we would get there. 3,600 relationships. Anyone, can anyone swallow that? 3,600 relationships? Can anyone oversee that many relationships? Ah, you say no. I'll say yes. There's one, I believe, that can oversee that many relationships. And it's not you or me. But we can't take God out of the picture, right? Because God is the one that is calling us to be in community with one another. Into relationship with one another. So, out of 3,600 relationships, are you going to agree? Nope. No. More than likely not. And there's something coming up this year that will probably make disagreements even more frequent. Have you been getting anything in the mail? Because not only... Do we have different understandings? Do we have different ideas and thoughts? But we also have very different life experiences too. Out of this, we're, we're making math easy this morning. Out of the, the 60 individuals that are here, if we say the average age is 55. Okay, if we say the average age is 60. How many years of experience is that in this space right now? 3,600 years of experience. That's a lot of experience, isn't it? That's a lot of life that has been lived. And so when we take all of that, the relationships, the experiences, and we, we learn to to cultivate those relationships and these experiences, then this community, not only has it lived through a lot, but understands that in that, 
is change. How many people still have a rotary dial phone hanging on your wall? I wish. I don't know. I sort of like the, the sound of the touch tone phone, then the da 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 da. We understand that living into community takes work. It takes time. It takes intentia. And it's, it has to be built intentionally. So this then is the advice that Paul gives to the church. The virtues that Paul is giving uh, to the church is directed to how we treat one another within the church. Paul is not trying to, to give us insight into how to treat those outside of the church. He is trying to give us insight into how to treat each other inside of the church. Now, after saying that, can it overflow into uh, the greater community? Sure, absolutely. Yes, it's a beautiful way of living, right? But first, let's figure out how to live it here, right? Let's figure out how to live it in this community and then practice it uh, out, outside of that as well. It's good advice. Uh, and it is important that we follow this advice for how we treat one another for reasons that we will see here in a little bit. Paul begins with speaking truth to one another, which implies that we need to not lie to one another. The reason for this uh, is that we are one with each other. And so if we lie to someone else, we're really lying to ourselves. So what happens then when you lie? What's that? Decisions. Okay, decisions are made based on, on truth. Uh, have you ever gotten caught in a lie? More times than I can count? I'm talking about myself. And so when you, when you get caught in a lie, how does it make you feel? Embarrassed? Guilty? Stupid? Yeah, you and me both. All, all of those. But then why do we sometimes do it? What, what puts us into the space of wanting to lie? Kindness? Oh, you, the, I, I get it. So um, I'm having a good hair day today, right? Yeah. Weakness? Okay, we, we are, maybe we're embarrassed of what we did. Yeah, where pride creeps back in, right? Fear, protection. Sure, protection. I don't want you to think poorly of me. We don't want to let anyone down, right? So we're going to say that we did it, even though we didn't. I don't, I don't believe that, that we don't always speak the truth to each other because we're uh, concerned that we will be excluded from the group that we're a part of. I don't, I don't believe that. Um, sometimes, yeah, maybe. Which is why Paul brings up two virtues that are really important when it comes to talking about community. Forgiveness and grace. Um, now, before we go too far down that road of forgiveness and grace, he talks about another concept uh, that, that I think really speaks to uh, our, our world right now. Uh, he speaks of thieves must give up stealing. Sort of a weird, awkward little thing in here when we're talking about relationships and connections, right? He talks about encouraging the church to work. One thing that we need to understand about the ancient world uh, is if you did not belong to a wealthy family and you did not work, there were only two ways to, to sustain life. One was to 
One was to participate in criminal activity, right? The other was to be uh, was to live off of wealthy patrons, so re receiving gifts from uh, wealthy individuals, which is why Paul was criticized by some of the churches that he served because he never received any money from the churches. He was a tent maker. He worked. And so there was a stigma about working. Uh, even today, we have the, the tendency to hold certain jobs as more important and a higher status than others. Maybe. But what Paul is trying to do here is trying to get the understanding that if you're going to be a part of this community, he wants you to, to work. And not just, to, uh, not just because work is work, but work so that you can give to those in need. Give to those in need. It's good for us to work because it also helps us to give to others. And giving then is an expression of gratitude, gratitude toward God. And it is out of this gratitude that we want to give back to God and give to others. What helps connect relationships? Focusing on what we don't appreciate about the person or focusing on what we appreciate about the person? Gratitude. Gratitude for one another is what helps build relationships. The other is, help, is what helps rip relationships apart. And that's what Paul again reminds us. He reminds us that our words matter. They can be used to build each other up or they can be used to tear each other down. He says, no, let no evil, uh, no evil come out of your mouths. Isn't that easier said than done? Now, uh, one thing that, that I think is helpful is uh, folks that are thinkers, or not, no, that, 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 that doesn't sound right. Fo folks that, maybe introverts. Uh, introverts are a little bit slower to talk, typically, and so uh, we do more talking inside of our heads instead of out loud. Uh, and there are moments where folks like to think out loud. And, and, and maybe we shouldn't be thinking out loud. Now, there's safe spaces where we can talk to, to other people and, and process things. That's not what I'm talking about. But have you ever just spoken something out of your gut instead of actually thinking it through first? And then immediately as the words leave your mouth, you go. Certain words come to mind. Open mouth, insert foot. I've eaten my foot more times than I can count. Which is why Paul says, put away, put away from all, uh, from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. Now, uh, anger is an, is an interesting thing because he says at the beginning, in your anger, do not sin. So there is, uh, there is righteous anger and we're not going to get into that. We're focusing on relationships. So the anger I'm going to talk about here is the anger between a connection, what would keep us from being in relationship with one another, right? And that's the anger that, we, that we're told to not let the sun go down on that anger because what happens with that anger then? It festers and it grows and it becomes bigger than what it was before. When if we just sit down and have a conversation, we still might not agree 3,600 relationships, we're not going to always agree. But what we can do is still love one another. Which is why then Paul encourages a different way of living. He says, let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need so that your words may give grace to those who hear. How do you define the word grace? Uh, 
The Olympics are going on right now. Uh, People have been graceful. If you look up the concise uh, Oxford English Dictionary, that's the first definition you're going to find is elegance of movement. The second definition out of the six that you will find underneath the word grace is a courteous goodwill. So let's go to the Greek, shall we? In the Greek, which also has six different definitions, one of those definitions is a beneficent disposition towards someone. Could also be translated favor, gracious, care, help, or goodwill. We are invited to show grace to one another, which is hard, isn't it? You don't agree with me that the millennials are the greatest generation. Come on. That's okay. Why? Because God is bigger than all of that. And God is calling us into relationship with one another. And so when we make each other upset or disappointed or frustrated or mad or angry, going and talking and showing grace, knowing that deep down we still love one another, I hope we still love one another, and we can disagree Verse 32 says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. And here we start to see the shift as to why Paul is encouraging us to live this way. Because it isn't because of Paul that we're called to live this way. We are invited to live this way. Why? Because Jesus has lived this way. And that is our example, that we are encouraged to live this way because Christ has lived this way. It reminds me of the prayer that we prayed earlier today. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Notice that it says, as we, in there, right? As we forgive those around us, forgive us. It's a mixture of the two. So how are we doing? How are we doing at giving grace to one another and giving forgiveness to one another? How are we doing at building up the community? How are we doing with our relationship with one another and our relationship with God? How are we doing? Living by grace and forgiveness is difficult. It's challenging because pride gets in the way. And sometimes it's difficult to get a true picture of our own selves when we carry our own pride. These verses that we hear this morning are inviting us, Paul's inviting us to be imitators of God by living in love. This love calls us to serve one another. Looking again to Jesus as the example of this compassionate love that Christ loves us and gave himself up for us. This is the example that we're given and shown, the example of how to live together in community, of how we can forgive one another, live in grace with one another, and grow together as Christ's church community. These words this morning invite us to wrestle, to think to ponder, to embody the love of Christ, and to live that love with one another, building up one another by grace and forgiveness 
so that we can be the church, the community of faith, the disciples of Christ that God is calling us to be. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you. We thank you for your loving grace and forgiveness that you have covered us with. Help us, God. Help us to grow in our relationship with you and to grow in our relationship with one another. Help us to be your community, demonstrating your compassionate love. For we love you, God, and we thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this week's sermon. We would love for you to join us again for worship in person or online, and we look forward to being with you next time.